Okay, so we're now uh, live on Facebook. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be learning uh, together again. This class is a uh, part of uh, Sefir Azman here at Drisha. Um, this is the second session of the class on law and practice in early Judaism with Dr. Malka uh, Z. Uh, Simkowicz. Uh, just uh, a reminder, quick reminder on how we run the classes. Uh, please uh, mute yourself when you're not actively speaking, just so we don't have uh, background noise. And just remember, I'll, I'll help mute you as well. So just remember to press unmute when you would like to make comments or ask questions. Uh, you can also uh, participate by uh, writing uh, in the chat box here on Zoom or as a comment on uh, Facebook if you're watching us live and I'll relay those uh, messages uh, and welcome if you're watching us on Facebook. Um, and with that, I'll turn this uh, to you, uh, Dr. Simkowicz. Thank you very much and thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your busy day to learn with me for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, in the second of our four-part series, Law in Early Judaism, um, I'm so glad to see all of you, and I really appreciate those of you who are able to turn on your, your camera, and some of you I know from different parts of my life, so it's really nice to see this learning community here. Um, last class, we, um, we discussed the concept of Torah and law in early Judaism, and I'm a little concerned that I wasn't totally clear about some big ideas that I wanted to convey. So I'm going to spend one minute just reviewing last week and then we'll dive in to some sources. Of the main ideas for those of you who weren't with us last week or weren't clear about the uh, central argument is that there is no formal category of oral law in the biblical period up until the second century BCE, or maybe even the first century BC. So for the majority of the Second Temple era, we don't have evidence that Jews are working with a category that the later rabbis would call oral law or unwritten law. Now, while there is no category, as far as I can tell, of oral law, and I'm using that interchangeably with unwritten law, there is a very dominant and very fluid, expansive notion of Torah. And I was careful last week to not use Torah with an article, the. We don't have a closed canon yet at this early stage. The rabbis try to close the canon much later, and there are still debates up until the Mishnaic era and later about what goes in and what goes out of this canon. But in the Second Temple era, there is no closed canon, um, but there is Torah, and Torah is the material that is transmitted in a cycle of reading and writing and interpreting and recording. Sometimes the Torah material is conveyed through public reading. Sometimes it's through uh, not reading a written text, but sharing orally what one heard uh, that someone else shared with them. And so there isn't really this teasing out of oral and written Torah at this early stage. And contrary to what many people assume, Torah, which includes but is not limited to law, is not just for sectarian Jews. All observant Jews and the majority of Jews at this time who are observant are not sectarian. All observant Jews are identifying themselves by keeping certain identifying markers. And we're going to talk about what those identifying markers are. Now, later, by the second or first century BCE, a category known as unwritten law is going to emerge. And that category is identified with sectarian practice. So while Torah in the broadest sense is something that all Jews are doing well beyond the sectarian world of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes, the category of unwritten law or oral Torah is affiliated with sectarian practices and specifically with the Pharisees who are known to be the antecedents to the rabbis. By its very nature, this concept of a category of oral law is controversial because it's considered unstable, 
because it empowers people in a way that calls certain authority into question, right? Who's to say what tradition uh, is part of this uh, oral law and what's outside of it? It contains elements that are attributed to ancient divine teachings, but also includes human interpretation. So it's an unstable category. And for this reason, the Sadducees will reject the authority of oral law and the Pharisees will claim the mantle of transmitting and uh, and communicating and developing this oral law. But all of that is later. I'm going to work um, with texts that are um, very meaningful to Jews outside of sectarian communities. We're going to focus on what average Jews in the Second Temple era were doing to identify themselves as Jews. So Jews at this time are observing what scholars today call common Judaism. We discussed this last week. What does it mean to observe as a Jew in the ancient world? It means to keep Shabbat and the holidays, right? A distinctive calendar. It means to practice circumcision on your baby boys. And it means to observe dietary laws. These are the three main identifying markers of Jewish practice in the ancient world that are beyond sectarian. Anyone who observed as a Jew kept these things. Notice what I did not say. I did not say purity laws, um, even though there is a conception that Jews in the land of Israel had this kind of obsessive fixation on purity. Um, I would not um, I would not say that there was compelling evidence that Jews, first of all, outside the land of Israel were equally observant of purity laws. And even within the land of Israel, the, uh, the observance of purity laws differs from community to community and does seem to be much more predominant in sectarian groups, again, such as the Essenes and the Pharisees. But I'm not focused today on sectarian literature. I'm focused on common Judaism, what the average Jew did, and that is Shabbat, circumcision, dietary law. And then the frosting on top of all of that is the regular coming together to read and interpret the scriptures, the Torah. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at some sources from uh, the Second Temple era, mostly from the second century BCE. And we're going to investigate the question of how Jews in the ancient world approach these three identifying markers, Shabbat, circumcision, and dietary law. And we're going to think about the ways in which these practices were considered to be subject to live debate and interpretation because while any observant Jew in the ancient world knows that they have to keep Shabbat, the question of how to do that is an open question. Likewise for, um, well, maybe not circumcision. I think that's pretty straightforward, but we do have uh, some diversity in uh, texts, especially regarding the observance of Shabbat and dietary law. So we're going to look um, at a source sheet and you're going to note a few things. So you can feel free to uh, click on the source sheet on your chat. But as always, I did tinker with the source sheet and I added a little bit this morning. So um, maybe if it's okay, just follow along with me. So as we look through these texts, you're going to notice, first of all, again, these texts are not sectarian. These are popular texts that are being circulated from Jewish community to Jewish community um, and, and uh, mostly come from the land of Israel, but there are some important exceptions that I'm going to show you. Many of these texts were written in Hebrew in the second century BC. Some of them were written in Greek, read alongside one another. We will see that the emphasis on Shabbat, dietary law, and circumcision traverses geographic boundaries. In other words, Jews in Alexandria hold these practices to be just as important as Jews in Jerusalem or in the Galilee. And they, um, and uh, they also um, tra traverse linguistic differences, by which I mean you could have a text written in Hebrew and a text originally written in Greek that both equally highlight the importance of these practices. So we have to be careful when we make certain assumptions about authenticity in the ancient world. And uh, sometimes we might assume that a Jew living in the land of Israel, speaking Hebrew, would have maybe um, a more uh, psychological or spiritual connection to these practices than a Jew living in Egypt who spoke Greek. But the text that we have in front of us tell us a different story. 
Uh, there is one distinction that I want to point out uh, in terms of Judean text versus Egyptian Jewish text, and that has to do with the effort to rationalize these practices. So you'll see a more blatant attempt on the part of diasporan Jews to rationalize these practices, Shabbat, circumcision, and dietary law. And the explanation, I think, for that is very straightforward. Jews living in Ptolemaic Egypt, um, Jews who are living with Greek and Roman neighbors are much more self-conscious about how to present their observances as philosophically um, sophisticated and rational. And you'll see a more self-conscious attempt to present Jewish law as rational. Uh, Jews in the land of Israel are less motivated, less interested to um, make a polemical argument for the integrity of their um, of their practices. So all of that is preamble for us to dive into the sources. Any questions before we do that? All right, so we're going to begin with Shabbat, as always, I don't um, delude myself into thinking we're going to get through every source, but we'll do what we can do. Um, and beginning with Shabbat, we're going to look at a text known as 1 Maccabees, and we're going to contrast this text with, predictably, 2 Maccabees. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen right now. Huh. Okay, there's PDF. All right, you know, actually, before I do this, I think I'm going to go down to Judith. Let's quickly go down to Judith. Okay, because Judith, Yehudit, is a story preserved in the Apocrypha. It's a novella. It's uh, preserved, in in other words, in the Catholic scriptures, but it is written by a very pious Jew in the late second century BCE who wrote this text in Hebrew. It's a fictional work, and we could talk about why I believe that at the end of the hour. It's a fictional work that I think is a play on the successful Hasmonean rebellion that takes place against the Syrian Greeks between 167 and 164 BCE. The way that I read this book is that Judith, Yehudit, is a play on Judah, Yehuda, that the way in which Yehudit, again, Judith, um, weaponizes and defeats the enemy uh, is very similar to earlier stories about uh, Judah Maccabee and his brothers um, and their supporters. So I read this as a kind of a play, a subversive play on the Hasmonean story. But for our purposes, all that's interesting is the way in which Judith is introduced. For seven chapters of the book, you see, I'm showing you chapter eight of Judith. For seven chapters of the book, we lay out a crisis that the people of a town is a fictional town called Betulia. There's no evidence that such a town existed. It means virgin town. It's a satirical name. Um, so for seven chapters, we read of a crisis that there is an enemy, uh, an Assyrian enemy coming to attack and they besiege this town and Judith ends up saving them. She ends up escaping from the siege, uh, seducing the general Holofernes and very famously in medieval art, beheading him. Uh, but the way in which she is introduced um, is fascinating because it gives us a glimpse into how one would describe someone who was very pious in the ancient world. And so the writer of the story, and it doesn't matter to me that this is a fictional story because the writer is speaking to a real audience, right? So we're focused on a real author and a real audience. And this real author is trying to tell the audience that Judith was a very pious woman. And so what are we told? That after her husband dies, she's a very pious woman and she, uh, she puts on sackcloth and she dresses in widow's clothing. And in her state of mourning, she fasts all the days of her widowhood, except for Sabbath and Sabbath Eve, that would be Friday, and for the new moon, right, Rosh Chodesh, the, the first day of the month, and the day before the new moon, because she was extra pious. And so the eve of a Sabbath or holiday is also kind of a mini holiday. And she did not fast on festivals either. So this gives us a glimpse into the notion that one way to celebrate the Sabbath at this very early stage in the second century BCE is not to fast, but to feast so much so that it was considered an obligation, uh, a mitzvah, a commandment that Jews had to have some kind of special meals 
on the Sabbath as part of their observance. And Judith is, is steadfast in observing these practices, even though she is uh, in her period of mourning. Now, interestingly, and we do have someone on this call, I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable, but I'm sure uh, Holly Taylor Kuhlman can tell us more about this. Early Christians observed um, observed the Sabbath not by feasting, but by fasting. There were, uh, I think, as early as the late first century, um, early, um, we wouldn't even say early Christians, but we would say Jews who believed in the Messiahship of Jesus. So in other words, they're coming out of a Jewish milieu, but we have evidence that they are fasting on the Sabbath. And either they're doing that to differentiate themselves from Jews, or there are other Jews who are observing their Sabbath by fasting. So we have some evidence that there's a live debate over how to observe this Shabbat, the Sabbath. And with that in mind, I want to look at another debate about how to observe the Sabbath that we find when we compare one Maccabees with two Maccabees. And that is the question of, it's a very practical question in the ancient world, can you fight wars on the Sabbath? And what happens when an enemy shows up at your door and says, hey, I know it's Saturday, but if you don't pick up arms, I'm going to stab you in the neck and kill you and your family. What do you do? Yeah, not a very pretty picture, but what do you do? Now we have very clear evidence that in the ancient world, this was a live debate among Jews. Do you violate the Sabbath by defending yourself and protecting your family and loved ones? Or in honor of the sanctity of the Sabbath, do you allow yourself to be killed? In other words, this really is a question about martyrdom. Another question that becomes very pertinent as early Christianity and the rabbinic uh, and broader Jewish community begin to separate themselves from one another in the second and third centuries, this question of in what circumstances should you embrace martyrdom or permit yourself to be martyred? These are very live questions. So I want to show you um, two texts about the Hasmonean Rebellion. And with your permission, I know I asked this last time, is it okay if I stop sharing, you can look at your own source sheet or would you rather follow along? Because I know people have different preferences. So anybody feel strongly, I could share this, uh, the 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 uh, source sheet, but then I won't see you. Any strong opinions uh, about I, that? I, I, I prefer you share the source sheet. Great. Okay, well, it's um, it's the only opinion I've received. So we're sharing the source sheet. Okay, back to the source sheet. All right, so we have one Maccabees here. One Maccabees written contemporaneously with Judith in the late second century BCE in the land of Israel in Hebrew, probably commissioned by a member of the Hasmonean family. So because of that, it's not particularly objective when it comes to the Hasmoneans. It's very, very pro-Hasmonean. And it, the author is careful to highlight all the heroics of the Hasmonean family. And it happens to be in this text that we find out that Matityahu, Matthias, and his five sons, including Judah, are very anti-martyrdom. This comes again from one Maccabees. Now, uh, if you go down, this is the, at the beginning of the work in chapter two, um, when the author is reporting uh, about the conflict that takes place as the Syrian Greeks are issuing this oppressive legislation saying uh, the Jews cannot keep what? They're identifying markers of Jewish practice. The Jews cannot keep Sabbath, circumcision, dietary law. Um, in other words, they want to strip the Jews of their ancestral practices and in doing so strip them of their identity. And so there's a rebellion and there are clashes. And then what happens? Um, the Syrian Greeks say to Hasmonean uh, rebels, enough of this, come out, do what the king commands, and you will live. And the rebels say, we will not come out, nor will we do what the king commands. And so profane the Sabbath day. In other words, we are not going to fight you on the Sabbath. Uh, because doing so will mean that the king will win. That's what he wants. He wants us to violate our ancestral laws. Uh, we would rather die. And so this is what happens very tragically. The enemy attacks them, but they do not answer them or hurl a stone. They let themselves be martyred, they said. Let us die in our innocence, right? It's better to not violate the Sabbath 
and heaven and earth will testify for us that you are killing us unjustly. Now, Mattathias hears of this and they say, absolutely not. This is intolerable. Um, and again, I think this is really interesting as you think about later debates between Jews and Christians and different attitudes towards martyrdom. Um, but the writer of this text, I think, is aligning with Mattathias's critique of this approach, right? There are Jews who are saying, no, we'd rather die than violate the Sabbath and fight you. And Mattathias says, no. If we all do as our kindred have done and refuse to fight with the Gentiles for our lives, they will destroy us, right? And we have to, we have an obligation to survive. They made this decision that day, let us fight against anyone who comes to attack us on the Sabbath day. day. Let us not all die as our kindred died in their hiding places. This is very straightforward. I read this as anti-martyrdom. One is in fact obligated, not merely permitted, but obligated to violate the Sabbath in order to survive. And so the Sabbath is important, but when it comes up against your own survival, you must violate it. Now, this is not the only approach that we find when it comes to the question of how to observe the Sabbath when it conflicts with, um, <clears throat> with um, your life. And so I wanna show you a text from two Maccabees. Now you might think one Maccabees, two Maccabees, they're all Maccabees, what's the difference? But this is a totally different book. We actually have four books preserved in the Apocrypha, although it's a question whether three and four are really in the Apocrypha. There are different lists of scriptural books in the ancient world, but there are four books from this era that are identified as the books of the Maccabees. One Maccabees, two Maccabees, three Maccabees, four Maccabees. Uh, the three Maccabees, um, three Maccabees is a totally different story about a, a terrible catastrophe that happens to uh, Alexandrian Jews. And I think, um, Maybe in the early medieval period, it was identified as three Maccabees because it looked a lot like the Hasmonean Rebellion, except that it takes place in Alexandria. And four Maccabees is a stoic, a philosophical expansion of two Maccabees chapter seven. Uh, so we're going to put those aside and focus on one Maccabees and two Maccabees. Remember I said one Maccabees was written in Hebrew in the land of Israel by someone who works in the Hasmonean court. Two Maccabees is totally, totally different. It's written in gorgeous Greek. It is contemporaneous. Let's say it's written maybe a generation after 1 Maccabees. Gorgeous Greek from the diaspora. The original text is lost, but it was once a five-volume work by a Jew named Jason of Cyrene, which is in North Africa, modern-day Libya. And in the early first century BCE, an editor condenses this five-volume work into what we have today, 2 Maccabees. It gets even more complicated because a first century BC editor adds a couple of letters that Jerusalem leaders wrote to Jews in Egypt at this time and then added them to the book. So if you open up the book of two Maccabees, you'll see the letters first, and then you'll see the condensed version of Jason's five volume work. So it's complicated. Here's what I want you to know. Two Maccabees, diasporan, Greek. The author is not really interested in holding up the Hasmonean family as the greatest heroes of all time. The author is interested in highlighting the permanent nature of God's covenantal promises with the Jewish people. The interests of the author are different. He's speaking to a, uh, a Greek speaking diasporan audience and he wants them to feel connected to Jerusalem and to the temple. So the story is roughly the same, but it reads very differently. The author of two Maccabees and not the Judean author of one Maccabees, inserts miracles. It's very theological. And at the center of the book is a series of martyrdom stories. And in these texts, the martyrs are the heroes of the Hasmonean rebellion, actually way more than the Hasmonean soldiers. So it's the martyrs, the people who are willing to die on behalf of their ancestral laws that are held up by the author as worthy of imitation. Of course, Judah Maccabee is in the story, but I don't think that he's as central as he is in one Maccabees. Um, so I want to go to, I don't think we have time to do all of this here. Um, here we have a similar account of an enemy attacking Jews on their holy day, except we 
we don't have the angry response of Judah Maccabee. So we kind of have this implication that these were very pious Jews who allowed themselves to be killed. We don't have Judah berating them afterwards. But the heart of Oh, uh, are we frozen? Uh-oh. Yes, we are. There, is it just, can you guys hear me? I can hear yes, you. Yes, we can. My screen was yes. dark what she was sharing. Hear you. Okay, perfect. So it looks, I'm glad you can hear me at least. That's good. So uh, let me just communicate to uh, Dr. Simkowicz because I think she's the only one who's frozen. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. Let me just resolve this real quick. Okay. So she'll probably restart and join back again. Again, thank you for your patience. It seems like she's just restarting her device. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me, Dr. Simkowicz? I'm so sorry about that. That's never happened to me. Uh, now I'm on my laptop. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. If you could just give me 10 seconds to set up. Oh, my. So glad you're back. I'm very grateful to have a, a backup screen over here. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm so sorry about that. Let's get out of the sun. Or not. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna try to share my screen again. All right, so we have two Maccabees six and seven, right in the middle of the story. We have an account of a series of martyr stories. You might've heard of the mother of the seven sons who later becomes um, identified as Hannah. Anybody know this story? Well, she doesn't have a name in 2 Maccabees 7, and that's the earliest account of this martyrdom story. Uh, but there's a less famous story, and that's the story of Elazar. So I'm just going to quickly, sorry again, um, I have to open up the file on my laptop. Okay, wonderful. All right. So here we have the story of Elazar, a man now advanced in age and of noble presence. He was forced to eat swine's flesh. So he was forced to eat pork. Pork is the most popular kind of meat that is eaten in the Roman world, and it is forbidden to Jews according to their ancestral laws. So he welcomes death with honor rather than life with pollution. He goes up to the rack of his own accord. His skin is, uh, well, you can imagine what they do. It's very, um, it's a very horrific, torturous death. Um, and um, and this is a reflection of the greatest acts of piety, making a high resolve worthy of his years and the dignity of his old age and the gray hairs that he had reached with distinction and his excellent life even from childhood. Um, he uh, uh, declared himself quickly, telling them to send him to Hades. And then he has this uh, very compelling, beautiful speech. You could see if you do a, a very brief uh, comparison between the style of writing of one Maccabees and two Maccabees, you'll see the flowery language of two Maccabees. It's very Hellenistic. It's very stylized. It reads like a Greek novella. Um, he's never worried about long sentences. Uh, the style is totally different, but in content, in a way, two Maccabees is more pietistic than one Maccabees. Rather than making an argument for the legitimacy or the integrity of the Hasmonean family, the author here is focused on temple, on Jerusalem, on pietistic devotion, and on martyrdom. 
In this way, Eleazar died, leaving in his death an example of nobility and a memorial of courage. And then after telling the story of Eleazar, then he goes into the extremely famous story of the mother and the seven sons. And I did not include the whole story here. It is very long, but I encourage you to look it up yourself. Um, each of the seven sons is tortured horribly in a different way. And then at the end, the mother herself is killed. In this tradition, in both the mother and the seven sons and Elazar are willing to be killed rather than eat pork, right? So this is different than saying, ah, I'm going to violate the Sabbath because otherwise you'll kill me, right? This is like, this is because of eating pork. Now in later, um, in later rabbinic traditions, versions of the story have the king telling the mother and the seven sons to worship idols because violating dietary law is actually not in later rabbinic imagination a good enough reason to, to be martyred right the rabbi say no, no 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 you can't be martyred eat the cheeseburger right if somebody says i'm gonna kill you if you don't eat the cheeseburger or the pork you eat it but if someone says you have to kill someone or you have to engage in forbidden sexual relations or you have to worship idols, then, you know, in very limited circumstances, then you should say I would rather die. But that's the later rabbis. In this early period of the late second century BC, it is not clear in what circumstances should you willingly go to your death. And so I think to Maccabees is quite stringent here to say, even if they ask you just to eat pork, it's better to die. And one Maccabee said, what are you nuts? Like, no, in fact, um, you shouldn't even keep the Sabbath if, um, if it means being killed. So you see from these various sources that there are certain open debates when it comes to how to observe the Sabbath and questions of martyrdom. Um, do we fast on the Sabbath or do we feast? Do we raise arms or do we not? Is the observance of the Sabbath something that is so um, non-negotiable that it's better to die rather than to violate it, right? These are all open debates in this early era. Now, for reasons of time, I'd like to go on to the second marker of identifying practice in the ancient world. We just talked about the Sabbath. Let's talk about dietary laws. And then if we have time, we'll go to um, sources about circumcision, which, as I said, are a little less ambiguous. Um, okay. Now back to Judith. And I'm going to be focusing on Judith and two Maccabees. I th actually, I don't have two Maccabees yet, but I have it in the circumcision section, I think. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to focus on these two texts in particular because they're contemporaneous. They're both late second century BC. And one is from the land of Israel and one is from the diaspora. And you can see the ways in which they reflect similar concerns and areas in which they diverge. And sometimes their divergences, as we've already noted, might surprise you. Let's go back to the book of Judith and look at the book's references to dietary observance. Now, the particular nature of how a Jew in the ancient world observed dietary laws is very vague to us outside of sectarian sources. But I really worry about focusing on sectarian sources because as I tried to explain last week, we don't wanna give the impression that law is sectarian, right? Anyone who's identifying as a Jew is observing some kind of Torah. If you want to talk about unwritten law, oral law, you could talk about the Pharisees development of that as a category in the first century um, or a little earlier. But law as a category is not sectarian. It, it, it's a little bit of a challenge to do this because when it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we actually have a lot to work with. But I don't want to give you the impression that it's only sectarians who are thinking about these issues. So we're looking at non-sectarian documents that make reference to dietary laws. And these laws are vague. We know Jews did not eat pork. We know that they separated out certain kinds of dishes and that they didn't mix certain kinds of foods. When Judith escapes from the besieged mountaintop town of Betulia, to go into the enemy camp, seduce Holofernes, 
behead him and then generate this victory for her people. She needs time to butter Apollofernes, to win his trust, and to gain mobility so that she can move around the camp freely. And the way that she does that is she says, listen, Holofernes, I can't eat with you because it'll be an offense. But I brought my food. And actually, a lot of Judith is very funny. We have some funny sort of satirical uh, images. And one of those images is Judith has this unnamed, I don't know if it's funny or it was funny at the time, you know, imagining this actually happening. But Judith has an unnamed slave. She has a handmaiden who really, she's, she's, um, identified in the English translations as a handmaiden or a servant, probably she's a slave. But uh, one of the kind of ridiculous images in the book is Judith sort of swanning out of Betulia, you know, like this elegant lady and the poor woman, the slave. Okay, it's not that funny, but it's just like absurd. The poor woman dragging all of her food and all of her stuff behind her. I, I imagine if this was performed as a play, maybe um, the less sensitive members of the audience would be chuckling at this image um, while feeling bad for this poor woman. Okay. Anyway, so Judith brings all this stuff with her, carried by her slave and uh, enslaved person. And Judith says, you know, I can't eat with you, Hall of Fairness. it'll be an offense. And one of the very funny things about this uh, book is that he's like, oh, I totally get that. You know, like, that's absurd. Nothing in the story, it, like, makes sense. So Hall of Fairness is like, yes, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. You can come and go, you could eat by yourself, you can pray by yourself and then join us. And he's so infatuated with her that he gives her total freedom within the enemy camp. Um, and that's why when she ends up killing him in his tent, people don't know where Judith is because they thought, oh, maybe she went out to have her meal. So it gives, it buys her some time. Um, all right. So anyway, um, she explains that she can't, um, that, that she can't eat with him, but then also he doesn't totally get it. He knows that, uh, or he feels that he'll be laughed at if, if he doesn't try to seduce her. So he says to a eunuch, his, his probably his enslaved person, go and persuade the Hebrew woman who's in your care to join us and eat and drink with us. So like, yeah, we know she has these dietary laws, but like, see what you could do to change her mind because it would be a disgrace if we let such a woman go without sleeping with her. So again, there's like an absurdity here. Um, Holofernes is a total buffoon in this story. You know, then he says, and talk about not being in tune with women. If we do not seduce her, she will laugh at us. Um, so Bagoas has to try to pretend, uh, well, Bo Bagoas is not pretending, Judith is pretending, but Goas goes to Judith and says, oh, let's, um, let this pretty girl not hesitate to drink wine with us and, you know, just abandon your ancestor laws. What's the big deal? Be today like one of the Assyrian women who serve in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. Like, why is it such a big deal? And now Judith, who's a total faker, remember she's pretending to be on everyone's good side, she says, oh, who am I to refuse my Lord? Whatever pleases him, I will do at once. It'll be a joy to me until the day I death, uh, until the day of my death. And she has this kind of Pollyanna-ish optimism, you know, pep energy, and they totally believe her. She dresses herself in women's finery. We know that she's faking it because she's actually, remember, in mourning for her husband. And then her poor enslaved woman, you know, uh, helps her get ready for uh, this big lavish dinner. So Judith is totally lying because, of course, she's committed to her ancestor law. But in the moment of crisis, she's willing to put it aside to save her people so now we see another angle does she think we can't know if she thinks she's going to be killed and if nevertheless she's still willing to violate her ancestral law but she is willing to pretend that she um is not committed to this core practice and um and we as readers know that she's devoted to her ancestral law but she's willing to pretend otherwise to the greek or assyrian enemy by the way, the reason why I say Greek or Assyrian is because the writer itself is not clear. Holofernes is a Greek name, but Holofernes is the general of the Assyrian army, which is one of the reasons that we know it's a totally fictional book, because there would not have been an Assyrian army with a general that had a Greek name. So the whole thing is satire, the whole thing is farce. But what's interesting for our purposes is that Judith 
is deeply devoted to her ancestral laws. She observes dietary laws. She brings her own food into the camp. She tells Holofernes, I can't eat with you. First, he totally accepts that. And then he says, but really how important is that? He has his servant convince her to eat with them. And she, again, we don't know if she actually eats with them or not, but she does say, sure. And then we have this wonderful double entendre. It will be a joy to me until the day of my death. We know why she's excited because Holofernes' execution will be a joy to her until the day of her death. All right, again, we know these are little snippets, right? These are like little golden nuggets that refer to dietary law. We really have, outside of the sectarian literature, very little to work with. That's just the reality. We have these references to dietary laws. The, the nitty gritty, the glot kosher, mahadran, we just don't know the details of these observances. We don't. But I will show you another text. This is from a novella called The Book of Tobit. Tobit is one of the most ancient uh, novellas we have that are not in the Tanakh, not in the Hebrew Bible. It was written in the third century BC, so quite ancient, from the land of Israel, written in Hebrew. It's absolutely hilarious and delightful. The writer, I think, had no intention of this being part of a, any kind of scriptural tradition, right? We shouldn't read Tobit and think, oh, you know, this writer kind of wanted to write in a sort of biblical style. No, it's a novella. Jews wrote things. The, this was entertaining. It has pious material, but it's completely outside the realm of anything that you would call scriptural. And the story <clears throat> is about a member of the Tobiad family, which was a real family in the ancient world. His Hebrew name would have been Tovia or Tuvia. And the Tobiads, I don't know if anyone's heard of them, but they were an elite family from Judea in the Second Temple era. And so here we have a fictional novella about someone who is part of a real family. And um, this novella, which talks about the adventures of Tobit, uh, he, um, goes on a kind of epic journey to <laughs> reclaim family treasure. It actually looks very Homeric at points, um, but the, the, the writer knows um, scriptural texts and cites various uh, texts from the Torah. In any case, what's interesting, again, for our purposes, is that the opening description of Tobit's, um, who speaks in the first person, the opening description of Tobit's personality includes his commitment to some kind of dietary practices. So just as the writer opens up the introduction of Judith by saying Judith was so pious that she fasted every day of her mourning period except for Sabbath and Sabbath eves and, and the first of the moon and the eves, so too we have an introduction to a hero by defining his piety according to particular practices. And in this case, it has to do with the way in which Tobit abstains from eating the food of the Gentiles. Now, some scholars have read this and interpreted these verses as saying, well, it's not really about dietary law, it's about purity law, right? Because maybe there were certain kinds of food that had not been uh, tithed and brought to the temple. Uh, I, I personally think that that's a stretch, but I want you to know that there are different ways of reading these verses. And I think that the authors or the scholars who do read these texts as referring to purity laws, I think it's because there's a little bit of a bias to suggest that Jews at this very early stage were keeping dietary laws. And it's more plausible to say that they were tithing for the temple. I don't, again, I don't see that in these verses, but you should know that the question of how to interpret this passage is an open one. Again, for our purposes, what's interesting, Jews were keeping dietary laws. They were keeping some kind of dietary laws. Now of these texts that I want to show you that references Jewish practices when it comes to food, I think the most fascinating one comes from Alexandria and Egypt. And that text is called the letter of Aristeas. But let's stop for a second. Any questions so far? Because we're already almost at the end of our time. I'm very excited to do Aristeas with you. All right, letter of Aristeas, contemporaneous. Can, can I ask of... what, oh, yeah. Yeah. So oh. what, what, what do you have to say about the sacrificial cult 
which was obviously played a very important role even in, in, in these texts. Maybe it's not common in the sense it wasn't on, on every street, but it certainly played an important role in the um, thoughts and ideology of the of the Jews at the time. That's class four of our series. Ah, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I hadn't looked ahead. <laughs> uh, let me just share. I know that some of you haven't had a chance or didn't uh, weren't at last week's class. So let me just quickly share the syllabus with you. Um, it's hard to organize a series like this because I don't want to say I'm not going to discuss the temple until the, the last class, but uh, but this is a huge question because the temple is very, very, very important. And at the same time, you have over a million Jews outside the land of Israel who are not moving to the land of Israel and yet are very devoted to the temple. I don't know why I can't put that in the chat. Uh, I have a PDF that I'm trying to put into the video, please. Sorry. Oh, wait, it, it's loading. It's loading. It's just taking a while. So hopefully that'll work. Um, let's, okay, do you see that? Lond okay, fine. All right. Um, let, let's um, let's go to our stairs. And then I don't know how much I'm going to do with circumcision, but it's it's the least complicated one. Um, okay, our stairs. Again, you're going to think by the end of the series that every single thing written in the Second Temple period was written in the late 2nd century BCE, because again, it's late second century BCE. It's written by a Greek speaking Jew in the vicinity of Alexandria. And it's the earliest account that we have that recalls the circumstances in which the Hebrew Torah was translated into Greek into the version, the version that we now call the Septuagint. There were many translations of the Torah that were circulating at this time. There wasn't just one Greek version, but the one that becomes the magisterial authoritative version, the one that's even read in some synagogues in Egypt, that's the Septuagint. It's widely venerated by Jews, even Jews in the land of Israel. And the letter of Aristeas is the earliest text that we have that recounts the circumstances in which uh, this Torah is translated. Now, why is it interesting for us? Because it happens to be that the letter of Aristeas opens with a series of interesting events and that includes a very extensive defense of jewish dietary laws i'll just give you a little bit of context here um Aristeas is a courtier of the late third century bce ptolemy to philadelphia okay this part is fictional so i'm gonna say this slowly because i know i talk fast Aristeas was written in the late second century bce the story is set a hundred years earlier, in the late third century BCE, in the time of the Ptolemaic, the Egyptian Hellenistic king, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who, legend had it, had commissioned the translation of the Hebrew Torah into Greek. The nature, the circumstances in which that happens, according to Arceus, we'll read it as novella, we'll read it as non-historical. But the fact that it was translated that's not disputable. Now, in Aristeas, we have this bromance between Ptolemy II Philadelphus and the high priest of Jerusalem, Elazar, where Ptolemy II Philadelphus sends a letter to Elazar, the high priest, and says, I want to embark on this translation project. Can you send me 72 scholars, 12 for each tribe? It's also how you know it's kind of fictional because you don't have tribes at this late stage. 10 of them are gone by 722 BCE. Send me, send me 12 scholars from each tribe. The Talmud has 70, but this version has 72. And Elazar says, that's an amazing idea. Of course I'm going to do that. Great idea. Again, that'd be totally fictional. Why would the high priest of Elaz of Jerusalem want to choose to be reading their scriptures in Greek? Um, and, um, and according to the story, he sends 72 scholars to Alexandria. They go to the island um, Pharos, the lighthouse, the famous lighthouse island, and they embark on this translation. Everybody has a big party. Uh, but at the beginning of Aristeas, um, after Elazar embraces the idea of translation, Ptolemy II sends lavish gifts to the temple. And then the courtier Aristeas, who's describing all these gifts to the temple and is admiringly describing the practices of the Jews and what they do in their temple and how they bring sacrifices, he goes on this long tangent defending Jewish dietary laws. Now, you have to understand, Aristeas in the story is a courtier of Ptolemy II Philadelphus, but the writer is an observant Jew. There are all kinds of interesting questions here. 
who is this text for, right? Is this text for, you know, not Jewish Greeks? Uh, because the Jewish author wants to defend the integrity of the Jewish religion and its scriptures to Greeks? Or is this text for Jews and trying to give them some morale? Like, don't feel too worried about how you guys are, you know, doing your separatist, observing your separatist customs, because in an ideal world, the Greeks would love us. So take pride in your tradition. Who is this text for? Scholars disagree over this question. Um, and, I, you know, the simple answer is it's for it's for more than one audience. There is a real self-consciousness here that we don't find in Judean text. So let's just take a quick a quick peek at, at this text over here. So one of the fascinating things is that Aristides has this long, long description of the Jewish dietary laws. And you can look at this on your own. But what I think is fascinating is that there is an attempt to rationalize what animals can be eaten and what animals cannot be eaten based on the nature of these animals. You don't find anything like this in Judean texts. Uh, you will find the uh, first century CE Alexandrian Jewish philosopher Philo doing the same exact thing that Aristeas does here, which is to say, you know, Greeks and Romans, they accuse us Jews of practicing irrational laws that we don't understand, but they're the ones who don't appreciate the fact that everything we do is rational. And so you think it's just random, we, didn't own, we don't eat certain things, but no, you're wrong. Moses knew exactly what he was doing, because the animals that have bad character, we avoid because when we eat those animals, we physically imbibe and are inculcated with those qualities. So these ordinances were made for the sake of righteousness to aid the quest for virtue and the perfecting of character, right? The birds that are tamed and clean and they only eat grain, like pigeons, turtle doves, locusts, those are all fine. But the birds which are forbidden, you'll find to be wild and carnivorous and tyrannical, right? And they cruelly obtain their food by preying on tame birds. And so those are unclean. And so there's like this very, very, very long explanation of the rationality of dietary laws, which suggests what? That Jews are being critiqued for observing laws that are considered to be irrational. So again, we don't have a lot to go on when it comes to Jewish practices uh, with food outside of sectarian sources. But I think we do see some discomfort from authors such as the Letter of Aristeas or a kind of compulsion to defend the integrity of these laws because we know, we have the sources for this, Greeks and Romans are critiquing dietary laws and especially the abstinence from pork as being totally nonsensical. Um, in our very brief remaining time, I want to say a few things about circumcision, and then hopefully we'll still have a few minutes for questions. Circumcision, the last of the three identifying markers of Jewish practice in the ancient world, also appears in Judith. So Judith has the big three. Judith has uh, circumcision, and it also has a Shabbat, Sabbath, and it has dietary laws. Um, and so that's how we know this writer was doubtfully sectarian, but definitely observant. Um, and where we have it is the uh, pious Gentile Achior, the Ammonite, who helps the people of Betulia defeat Holofernes uh, by giving them false information, by giving the, um, uh, the enemy camp false information, he ends up converting. Uh, when Achior saw all that God, uh, the God of Israel had done, uh, he firmly believed in, in uh, God. And so how do you convert in the ancient world? He was circumcised and joined the house of Israel remaining. So to the state, what's interesting here is what he doesn't do. He doesn't immerse. Right? He doesn't go into the mikvah. He doesn't go into the waters, which we know again from Christian sources as well as rabbinic ones, immersion into pure waters was a major part of a systematic process of conversion in the ancient world, but not at this early stage. In the second century BCE, we don't have a systematic method of converting, right? These issues are live, just like the question of how to observe the Sabbath is a live issue. But here, the author of Judah says he converted. How did he do it? He was circumcised. Simple. 
I think that if the author felt that immersion was a major part of the conversion process, it would have been mentioned in this verse. But it's not. It's totally absent. And this is a late second century BCE text that gives us a hint into how conversion was perceived at this early stage. Circumcision for men. It's interesting to think about what it would have been for women. Maybe it would have just been you're just joining the community. Sarah, I'm going to take you in a second, and I just want to show you one last thing. In 2 Maccabees, just like Judith, we have uh, an emphasis on the three major identifying markers of, of Jewish practice, circumcision, dietary law, and the Sabbath. And in 2 Maccabees, they're highlighted as things that the king prohibits. And so here, and remember, 2 Maccabees is pro-martyrdom. There are two mothers, this is very, very sad, but there are two mothers who are so committed to observing this practice of circumcision that it's very, very hard to read, that they circumcise their children and then they commit suicide with them. They kill themselves. So again, it's this kind of macabre combination of devotion to ancestral law um, and a feeling that martyrdom is a fulfillment of the greatest um, piety and not, as one Maccabees argues, uh, in some cases a sin. So again, what do I want you to take out of this hour? On the one hand, you have these three major identifying markers of Jewish practice and they're undisputed. But the question of how to observe the Sabbath, how to, and in what circumstances to circumcise, um, and how to observe dietary laws, I think that these are live conversations that are traversing geographic boundaries. All right, we've got four minutes left, and I see that there's a question from Sarah. I lowered my hand because I, I just want to ask about women, but as, as I was raising my hand, you answered the question. Ooh, that's great. It never happens. Thanks. Any other thoughts? I'm happy to just tell you a little bit about next week. Oh, I see Justin raise his hand, uh, which is that we'll dive into some sectarian sources. It just it cannot be comprehensive in a four part series. And I worry about giving too much attention to the sectarians when they're a tiny percentage of the Jewish population. So we're going to have to really just skim the surface next week. We'll look at um, look at sectarian sources and then we'll close with attitudes towards pilgrimage and the temple. All right, Justin. So this is a topic that's constantly gone over and over. What mechanisms could there have been for maintaining the book of Maccabees in Hebrew? It seemed like it's everywhere in Greek and now in English and now in modern Hebrew, but mm -hmm. somehow all the efforts taken to keep the Tanakh intact uh, for us somehow faltered or couldn't exist or were deep sixed when it came to the book of Maccabees. I don't, Is there any I'm not sure. new thinking? I'm not sure I understand your question because one Maccabees was never in the Hebrew Bible. Right. But it was but circulated it, and it was translated into Greek pretty early on, and then we lost the Hebrew version. We do when, know that the Hebrew, yeah, Go ahead. When we lost it, how could every extant uh, you know, copy be lost or any tradition um, of it in Hebrew be lost? I know yeah. things things got difficult. Yeah, I mean, there's no printing press. These things are so expensive. The average household did not have these texts. If you were an upper middle class Jew, you could commission your favorite books from a local scribe, uh, but then you'd have to choose your favorite books, right? You wouldn't, it was oh. unlikely that you'd have like every book of the scriptures and every, you know, I even shouldn't say book, I should, I should say scroll. It was unlikely unless you were very wealthy that you had all the scrolls that were scriptural and all the scrolls, you know, from that were being, you know, okay. produced in your lifetime. So so they're rare. I recall the Anchor Bible, one Maccabees um, commentator said that the Greek version was popular everywhere and people seemed to have access to it. It seems very odd that, that there was no Hebrew. Jonathan Goldstein's um, commentary, his Anchor Bible commentary is, is outstanding. But sometimes he says things, and I don't want to put this great scholar down, but there are historical suppositions in that in that commentary okay. um and I, and I i agree that this must have been an extraordinarily popular book because it's well cited but we just don't, don't have the extant manuscripts okay just don't yeah yeah 
I like the mystery. You know, I, I like I like the questions that don't really have obvious answers. I mean, this is just this is just what it means to be looking at ancient texts. Wouldn't it be more likely that the literate Greeks learned uh, literate Hebrews learned Greek rather than Hebrew? And so yeah, no I mean, I think that's true. I think that there are there are Jews in the land of Israel who could read Greek. And that maybe once it was translated to Greek, they maybe were reading it in Greek. Whereas it's less likely that a Jew in Alexandria is studying Hebrew text. I think so. I don't know that most Jews were reading fluently in Greek in the land of Israel, but I agree that it was more likely that they're bilingual in the land of Israel. It's a really interesting insight. Great insight. I think we have to wrap up, but I'm going to put my email in the chat as always. You can send me. Um, you, you can send me an email with questions. We're covering a lot in this course, and I know uh, sometimes I have to zoom through things that I would like to give more attention to. Uh, but next class, like I said, we'll focus on some sectarian sources. It will not be comprehensive, so keep your expectations realistic. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in one week. Okay, perfect. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sienkiewicz, and thank you so much to everyone who uh, participated today and uh, to all of those who are always part of our learning community. Uh, just a, a couple announcements that um, the Safira's month starts at, at well, started this week with uh, classes meeting uh, Sunday through Thursday in the mornings, uh, afternoons and evenings. Uh, other highlights other than this class is uh, Talmud, uh, comparative uh, myth mythologic, <laughs> Israeli here, uh, methodologies of study on uh, Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Eastern with Rabbi Shmuel uh, Hain, I believe. Uh, the last name is and um, again more uh, announcements about classes and registration forms are available at uh, drisha.org slash classes hope to see you in more of our classes and uh, for now bye bye <laughs>